I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world, uncovering the tastes, traditions, and the recipes Look at that. of the world's best baking cities. I love coming into bakeries. From the historic streets of Palermo <laughs> to the multicultural city of San Francisco. Mm, I love it. Welcome to City Bakes. Today, I'm in one of the most important historical and spiritual places in the world. Here, I get to grips with the newest street food on the block. Yes. Excellent. Yes. I'm introduced to a very unusual dessert. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I discover breads I never knew existed. Shrimp bread all over the world, and this is one of the best. It's like nothing I've ever had before. And I'll be doing some bakes of my own. A bagel like you've never seen before. It's like a tear and share, <laughs> really. And a sweet and sticky date and pomegranate cake. Welcome to City Bakes, Jerusalem. When it comes to ancient cities, you don't get much older than Jerusalem. It's racked up nearly 5,000 years of incredible history. Jerusalem is a real melting pot of culture. There's people from all over the Middle East, North Africa and Europe, all facing themselves here. Geographically placed where the cultures of Asia, Africa and Europe meet, Jerusalem attracts over three million visitors a year. It's one of the holiest cities for the big three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I want to find out how all these different cultures come together to produce the food of Jerusalem. What is the food of Jerusalem? It's going to be a fascinating journey. Because there's one thing you can be sure of, where cultures clash, you often get the most exciting food and flavors. Wow. Now, this is Sakhlab. It's basically coconut, nuts, fruit, cinnamon, spices. That is the Middle East right there. And just as good as the drink itself is the view when you turn around. The Damascus Gate. <laughs> there's walls, and there's walls. Built in the mid 16th century, this wall still completely encloses the old city. But outside it, the city has spread. And Jerusalem's biggest food market, Makan Yehuda, is in this new city. It's pretty vast. The senses just go mad. The smells here are incredible. Some of these spices and the herbs that I see, I, I, I don't even know what they are. To help me understand this complex culture, I've arranged to meet Gil Havav, who is one of Israel's best-loved celebrity chefs and food journalists. What he doesn't know about this place isn't worth knowing. Hello, girl. Ah, nice you to meet you, my friend. You are, nice to meet you. I was wondering, when will you appear? Sorry. I was trying to get to the market. There were so <laughs> many people. <laughs> she says I'm more handsome. Anyway, welcome to the heart of Jerusalem. I mean, everything happens here, really. You meet everybody, religious people, non-religious people, Jews, Arabs, Christians, you name it. And, of course, if you want to understand the baking scene, it all starts from here. Yeah. Can I show you one pastry that I really love? Yeah, I think absolutely. that it's over here. This is something very Jerusalem-like. We call it biscochos. A little biscuit with sesame seeds on it. But it's uh, savory. It's not sweet. Taste it. It's really good. Oh, and it's not fried, it's baked. No, it's baked. I can oh. see it. What is in there? What is it? 
flour, salt, olive oil. That's it. That's some it. sesame and that's it. And some yeast. The juice is great. Yes. Yes. It tastes a little bit. Actually, it tastes a little bit like a cracker, but on another level. Paul, oh, if you are going to call our biscochos crackers, we're going to beat you up. So <laughs> start behaving, my friend. You're in the market. This is Jerusalem, OK? <laughs> Let's keep on moving. Well, that's told me. I've clearly got some learning to do. I mean, how has the food culture developed? Because obviously, Israel was formed in what, uh, 1948. 1948. Yes. So imagine well, people from 60 different countries and cultures coming to the same tiny spot with their food, with their traditions. So you have spices from all over the world, cooking techniques from all over the world, and from different continents. I mean, it's Yemen and India and Persia, of course, and the United States and England and France and Russia. And the mixtures that you see are sometimes appalling and sometimes very, very creative and inspiring. The first place Gil wants to show me is in a cafe, where fusion is very much on the menu, but all in just one bake, the shamborak. I think it's something that you've never tasted. <laughs> OK. <laughs> this is Ishtabach. This is a Syrian Kurdish place, Hello. and this is the owner. Welcome. Oren is a born and bred Israeli, but thanks to his Kurdish grandmother, who fled to Jerusalem over 30 years ago, he grew up on these Syrian Kurdish hot fill pockets that were traditionally made with leftovers from the Sabbath. And I'm getting a lesson. I'm going to take my coat off. I'll then. keep your coat. All right, thank you very much indeed. It all starts with a simple seeded dough. So we have flour, salt, uh, yeast. Sugar, sugar. And yeast. That's all, water. That's, it. That's all. But it's the various fillings where Oren goes off piste. First up, a veggie version. So it's a uh, sweet mashed potato, uh, lentils, yeah. and uh, mushrooms. Yes. We take chimichurri, parsley, cilantro, garlic, lemon, a little bit of chili, yeah. roasted onion, and then we just stretch it slightly. Stretch uh, okay. it, then and close okay. it. Did you notice how many nations are in this pastry? It starts with a dough which is Kurdish and Syrian. Yeah. Have the sweet puree, which is Indian, comes from Oren's wife. He loves her so much that he married her twice. <laughs> then you have chimichurri from South America. So this is modern Jerusalem here yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. in the Jerusalem at its best. Oren is also famed for his slow-cooked, melt-in-the-mouth kosher meats, including brisket and beer and pastrami. Sounds like something you get in a New York deli. Right, let's have a go. I'm gonna do it like a pizza. Oh, <laughs> Is that big enough? Yeah, it's okay. Now choose meat. Chick meat. Yeah. A little bit of this. Yeah. A little bit of onion. This is like making uh, the best pasty in the world. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Respect. Simple as that. <laughs> it becomes all right. <laughs> Seven minutes and it's done. Well, you slice it down the middle? Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is fantastic. So much flavour in there. The beef, the way it's cooked, long periods of time, the dough. You could sit here for hours eating one of these. The only word I could use to describe it, it's magic. Thank you very, very, Thank you very, very much. much, buddy. That was fantastic. If the rest of my trip is as flavor packed as that pie, I'm in for a real treat. Have a nice day. I want to show you and a very special Ethiopian bread. Right. It's in this shop. Shalom. Ta da! Wow. Wow. It's like a massive crumpet. It looks alive, doesn't it? <laughs> it's called injera, 
and it's made from a gluten-free Ethiopian grain called teff. It's, it's strange, isn't it? And the dough is fermented for days before cooking. And it's not fried, it's seared on a very hot pan, and then it bubbles. Look at it. It's quite rubbery, elastic. It's got the texture of a crumpet. It tastes like a strong sourdough, and, a, and I'm talking a sourdough, because the flavour is intense in the mouth. You eat it as the base of the Ethiopian lunch or dinner. So on it, you would put lots of condiments, yeah. either meat or vegetarian, roll it and eat it. I mean, I, I get it, I understand it, <laughs> but I don't like it. Try it with Nutella. I love it. <laughs> Anything with that works. <laughs> for most Jerusalemites, this market is still the place to come for all the amazing produce grown in Israeli soil. Oh, look, 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 look what we have here. Ah, right. Dates. These are the majhul. Once they used to grow them only in Iraq, and yeah. it was a very well kept secret. Jews who were fleeing from Iraq to Israel in the 50s brought a few pits of majhul dates in their pockets. Right. Now Israel is the exporter of more than half of the majhul dates in the world. Wow. So we took the lead. I'm beginning to see just how creative the Israelis are at absorbing food brought here from the Jewish communities worldwide and many other cultures and making all this their own. So, Paul, I understand that you really like flatbreads. Yeah, I do. And the next place Gil wants to show me is another prime example. <laughs> Voila! Shalom, Abale. Shalom. Zem inside, you're invited inside already. Come in. I'll keep your coat as usual. <laughs> this bakery is famed for selling one of Jerusalem's most popular street foods, and it's not falafel. Hello. It's called sabich, and it's also from Iraq. Aubergine, roasted. Piled on top of that goes egg, fresh Israeli salads, sesame paste. Zambar. Amba is mango pickle. Wow. It's Iraqi Indian sauce. It's addictive, but it comes out in your sweat. <laughs> Beware. <laughs> Sabich was brought to Jerusalem by Iraqi Jews back in the 40s and 50s. 70 years on, it's a bestseller. That is a thing of beauty. It's simple ingredients, but joined together the way it has, and that little mango sauce spice at the end, it's just, oh, it's delicious. Really, really good. Like so much Middle Eastern street food, it all starts with a flatbread the oldest breads in history. Only flour, other salt. That it? Yeah. That's beautiful. How many of these do you make a day? Maybe 3,000. Oh, my God. 3,000? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Flatbreads come in tons of varieties. This is called ashtanur. It's a very wet sourdough, and it's cooked in a taboon, traditionally a clay oven. It's been used since biblical times throughout the Middle East. Well, he's just give me a piece of dough. I'm taking it, he wants me to open it up. <laughs> OK. What? Looks like a pair of underpants. <laughs> yeah. Like that. Very good. Why does it stick to the oven? Because it's wet, sticky, probably 70% liquid. If that was dry, it wouldn't stick. And the oven's so hot, if you put your skin on it... Yeah, I, I, don't try it, please. You want to cosmetica? <laughs> Take it. Oh, very good. Oh, yeah! Another one. Velecha, how do you call it? Hassan. Hassan. So, Tzion is Jewish and Hassan is Arabic. Ah. And they work together. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> what a great way to end my first day in Jerusalem. Thank you very much, buddy. Uh, you do, we don't shake hands here. Take care. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank Take you. care. And what an eye-opener it's been. What you have here, and I'm re realising it very, very quickly, is world baking. 
in about four square miles. It is the most incredible place. It's alive, it's vibrant. Do you know what? I don't think I've even scratched the surface yet. I'm in Jerusalem on a baking journey of discovery. Very great. And before I do anything else today... Can I take one of these, please? I want to get my hands on the bread that you see all over the city. Basically, it's known here as the Jerusalem bagel. These are sold fresh all day for munching with salads, soups and dips galore. It's a bit more oval than the ones we think of, but... Do you know what? That is fantastic. The sesame seeds, the flavour, the caramelisation, the crumb, it's soft, it's nutty, it's absolutely delicious. This morning, I'm heading into the Old City, one of the best preserved medieval Islamic towns in the world. It's odd for me, the last time I was here was about 24 years or so ago, and I actually came here with my nan. I brought her here because she always wanted to visit the Holy Land. Its current layout dates back to the 12th century, when the Ottomans reclaimed the city from the Crusaders and it was divided into four quarters, Armenian, Jewish, Christian and Muslim. You can hear the call to prayer now and it echoes around the city. Sounds incredible. The hairs on the back of your neck, you feel standing up. For Muslims, it's sacred as the place the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven. For Jewish people, it's the biblical Zion, the city of David, the eternal capital of the Israelites. And for the Christians, it's where the Last Supper, the Crucifixion, and the Resurrection took place. You have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Christian side, and then the Islamic side with the Dome on the Rock. And you can actually see this. They're the church bells now. It, it, it's really... <laughs> My nan would have loved it up here. She would have really loved it up here. What an extraordinary place. Today, I'm exploring the bakes and flavours of the old city. I've just picked up this. I'm still not sure what it is. I saw it and said, can I have that, please? It's a bit like a donut on the outside. It's soaked in like a rose water and there's nuts inside it. The flavour is amazing. It seems I'm going to need some help. Oh, I'm so Hello. happy to see you. Italia I. Moore is a food blogger, chef and cookery teacher and has promised to show me the highlights. So basically this part of the city, you know, it's where all the good flavours came from. That's what I think. Our first stop is Italia's favourite Palestinian dessert. This is like the king of the Arab pastries. It's called knafe, something that from all around Jerusalem, people come specially here to Jaffa to eat. They made it on this huge tray, and it's a molina on top of it, yep. and goat cheese in it. Goat cheese. Goat cheese. They pour sugar syrup on it, yeah. and the pistachios as well, and it's like the combination between the savory dish to something that is super sweet. I've got to taste this for myself. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> yeah, I like it. It's like um, a texture of mozzarella, so it's got a bit of a bite to it. It's got a little bit of a string to it as well. There it is, there, see? On the top, you have this semolina to give you the crunch, and then a pistachio. It does work. It's sweet and a little bit sour as well. I'd love to be able to be allowed in the back yeah. if they'd let us go in the back and see how it's done. Charlie, you want to see it in the back? <laughs> Thank you. To see all the secrets. Absolutely. <laughs> Adnan and his family have been making knafe here since 1949. I used to work it since I was at school. Wow. I came to help my father when I was 12 years old. Wow. wow. Till now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the knafe starts with semne butter, 
that's fermented sheep's butter to you and me, being rubbed liberally all over the cooking tray and then covered with the brothers' own semolina mix. Can I feel it? Yes, please. It consists of flour and water only. Mm -hmm. For maximum flavour and texture, it's covered in two types of goat's cheese, one from the West Bank and the other from Turkey. It's not strong. It's not, not a strong, strong cheese, no. 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 Another sprinkling of semolina. And that's it? That's it. And it goes straight on the hob. How long does it cook for? Maybe 10 minutes. Yes. I can make it in two minutes. If you turn the heat up. <laughs> <laughs> Once cooked, it needs to be artfully flipped. <laughs> so basically, it's been cooked upside down, a bit like a tart tata. And the base, the crispy base, is the top now. Thank you very much indeed for letting me in. You're most welcome. Thank you. I'd help him carry it out, but I won't. <laughs> Back in the shop, the finishing touches are added. And voila, it's ready to serve. One of Jerusalem's favourite desserts, a Palestinian staple. Bye. Bye, -bye. On with the tour. And this is like the centrum of the old city. Yeah. Everywhere it's new flavors, and of course you can look at this pyramid. I'm just you know, wondering you what that is. So it's uh, what we call zatar. You can try some. <laughs> it's really similar to oregano. Yeah. It look alike, and usually they mix it with sesame, which is the base for everything. everything. Yeah, yeah. You know? We love sesame. You're so lucky to have that volume of herbs and spices on your doorstep. Yes, that's amazing, and uh, wow. These look like yes, things, and this is the halva. The base is very simple. It's yeah. just uh, tahini and sugar. Sometimes they add, like, uh, coffee or cocoa flavor, and we eat it a lot. We love it. We really love it. Halva might be an Israeli favorite, but this sweet, sugary sesame seed confection is most definitely Arabic in origin. It's eaten like cake and even spread on toast. What's this? This one's the marble, the cocoa one. The cocoa, okay. yeah. Okay. This is the most famous yeah, the most famous. Yeah. The, the wow. It's really good. That's great. Yeah. You have one with sesame seeds as well. Yeah, this one, just sesame seeds. Yeah. They are delicious. Ah, you Spectacular. Have it as well? I've had it before. I love it. It reminds me of my childhood, really. And but it's the only thing it's like, it's like, um, it is like peanut brittle mm -hmm. with sesame seeds on it. But the, that chewiness as it takes it to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank nice you, to friend. meet you. And you. Okay. Thank you. Beautiful. Time to say goodbye to Italia. And you are most welcome. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Because all of these exotic flavors, herbs, and spices have inspired me to do some baking of my own. A bit of Israel, a bit of Palestine, and a bit of me. The hotels kindly allowed me to use their beautiful courtyard to produce a fantastic bread. I'm going to show you how to make the iconic Jerusalem bagel, topped with sesame seeds, and for my twist, some amazing za'atar I picked up in the old town. This is an easier bake than the bagel you might be expecting. Now, this is not the one that's boiled with a little bit of malt. This is not boiled at all. This is straight into the oven. So, begin with strong bread flour. Then you add your sugar, a little bit of sweetness to it. On top of that, some salt, a little amount of yeast. Water, straight in and begin mixing it around in the bowl. Bring in those core ingredients together. OK, and pop that onto the table. Once it's formed a ball, it's time for a workout, because this dough needs some thorough kneading. Now, do this for about five minutes or so, and this will be enough to create a nice, strong dough. Happy with that now? Pull the bowl back, you mixed it in, drop it in, cover it up, just leave it alone. Because it's only got a tiny amount of yeast, it needs a long eight-hour prove, but that will give it great flavour. You end up with a dough that's risen like this. That's much lighter, it has got air in it. It's got a beautiful smell. 
Now, to make the bagel, stretch out your dough first, roll over the end bit. Split your hands and gently roll it out. Turn it round and join it together. Give it a little shake out to create the oval shape. I'm happy with that. Pop onto a tray and leave to rise for a couple of hours. And then we can put our toppings on. So I've got the basic shape. It's ready to go in the oven. I'm going to get some water, brush that onto the top so I can adhere the seeds to this. Traditionally, sesame seeds are used. I have a little gap, a little bit more, a little gap. But my extra twist is some za'atar herb mix I picked up in the old town. Za'atar, I absolutely adore. This, for me, represents a lot of Jerusalem, the flavours, the aromatic smells as you go through the old town. And that is ready to go in the oven. Quite high, around 220 at home, as high as your oven will go, and leave it in there for around 20 minutes. And there you have it, the Jerusalem bagel with that beautiful shape. It's like a tear and share, <laughs> really. Not just saying it, but actually tastes amazing. The flavour of the za'atar and the sesame seeds together take this to a whole new level. It's something you have to try at home. I love it. I'm in the holy city of Jerusalem on a baking pilgrimage. Put. Looks like a pair of underpants. <laughs> I've already had my fair share of divine bakes, both Jewish. It's so much flavor in there. And Arabic. It's sweet and a little bit sour as well. But I can't come to Jerusalem without delving into the world of kosher baking. Kosher being the famously complicated set of food laws that the religious Jewish community strictly adhere to. What I'm curious to find out is how does baking being kosher, how does that affect the bread, how does that affect the pastries, how does that affect the cakes? Does it make it better? Does it make it worse? Does it make a, a technique different? Is there certain ways you have to do things? And with thousands of years of Jewish lawmaking, I've got my work cut out. So for me, it's about a little bit of detective work. So I've come to Mir Sharim, the most orthodox Jewish neighborhood in Jerusalem. It's very noisy, isn't it? I'm heading to one of its busiest kosher bakeries, Avikail. This looks a very old bakery. Father and son are in charge of this family-run bakery, which churns out their kosher bakes that all adhere strictly to Jewish law, which dictates how food is cooked, eaten and sold. Hello. Hi. How are you? Nice to meet you. I'm Paul. I'm Guy. Hello. Nice to meet you, Guy. This is uh, my father. Hi, Paul. Great bakery you've got here. It's massive. Yeah, very old. It was started in 1932. 1932. 32. Wow. The bakery is open 24-6, being closed on Saturdays for Sabbath. Now, the thing is, what I want to find out is... What's the difference between... Exactly. Kosher uh, baking and the way I bake. Yeah, no, what? no, no, I'll tell you. Uh, there are a lot of things that we cannot do. Yeah. 90% yeah, yeah. of our customers are real religious people. Okay. Yeah. So we make difference between Par dairy products and, and parve yeah. products. Do you say parve products? Parve yeah, products. Parve, parve. parve, parve. parve with no, no milk, dairy. No, no, uh, no milk, no milk, no, no dairy. Meat. Ah, yeah. no milk. No okay. Meat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So one of the main restrictions is that you can't eat dairy in the same meal as meat or up to six hours afterwards. So not only do they have to make dairy and non-dairy versions of everything, the bakery has to be carefully laid out to avoid any confusion for their customers. Everything you have in the lower shelf is the parve products. I've got dairy in as well. No, dairy is here. So dairy is there. Dairy is there. Yeah, it's different. Dairy is here okay. and all the parve is here. OK, parve is there, dairy is there. It's not just dairy or non-dairy. They even make a type of bread for the busy Jewish customer called Mezanot. 
This is Maisonot. Every time you see here the ticket, yeah. it's within Maisonot. You said Maisonot? What does that mean? If a religious person wants to eat some kind of bread, he has to make a blessing afterwards. And if he wants to come and eat quickly without blessing, he can... A small blessing. You have yeah. to say that. And he can take a, a Maisonot. These stickered bags are made in a way that means they no longer qualify as bread under Jewish law. Uh, to make it mesonote, we have to put some apple juice in the dough. Right. No water. OK. Can I try? Can I try? Yeah, of yeah, course, yeah, take, of take. course. Completely different. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. So by using apple juice instead of water, the blessing can be circumvented altogether. Everything here in this bakery is chametz. Chametz is... This is getting really complicated. Yeah, 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 very. Wow. I had no idea. I came here... Sorry, I can't stop eating these biscuits. It's delicious. I came here wanting to learn a little bit about Jewish baking and what is kosher baking. What I've done is scratch the surface, unfortunately, and discovered that I don't understand anything. That's basically what's happened. There is significance in everything here. These guys know what they're doing. They've been doing it for years, but so difficult for me to understand. It's so complicated. I feel like I need to get back to something I know about, and I've asked if I can help plat the holla, a traditional Jewish loaf. I love a good plat. With Paul, we are going to finish early tonight. <laughs> well, I've platted a few loaves before. Oh, I understand. Wonderful. Now, <laughs> now we're going to make a, a big challah, one and a half meter for the tish. What's the tish? A tish is a table. Oh, okay. Tish in Yiddish is a table. OK. Friday or any kind of uh, celebration, okay. the rabbi makes a meal for all his people that are working for him. He, has, you do he a... opens a tish, he opens a table with food. And for that, we make a special big, challah. long challah. I should have known that even platting here would get a bit complicated. No, no, not from the middle. Only from, from, the, the, only from yeah. the sides. Oh, you want to taper it off? Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. Now take another one. Mine. I may have made plenty of platted loaves before, but none that are a metre and a half long. Hold it. Hold, hold this here. OK. It's in. <laughs> it's fantastic. Now, that's what you call the fast. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Staying in Mir Sharim, I've heard of a cafe I have to check out for lunch. This place apparently makes the best falafel in town. But it's the breads that Yoni and his dad wrap their falafels in that I'm really interested in. This is it. Hello. Hello, welcome. Nice to meet you. Hello, Paul. How are you? Nice to meet you. Hello. Hello. This is a Yemeni bakery. In the 50s, virtually the whole Jewish community from Yemen fled to Israel to escape persecution and brought with them incredible skill in baking. This is Zalabia, fried pita. Fried pita? Yeah. Wow. And this is lachuk. It's looked like crepe, but it's not. It's Yemen pita. Yeah. You want to come? Please, to, yeah. To make yeah, with fantastic. us? Right. Come on. Thank you. So, first, you have to be cold a little. Okay. You take one spoon. Yeah. And this is lachuk. Both these traditional Yemen breads have the same ingredients flour, yeast, salt, sugar, and baking powder. This is Zalabia, right? But the water content is hugely different, and one is cooked in oil. That's a much, much drier dough than this. This is more like a pancake. Actually, it reminds me more of a blini, when you see the, the way the bubbles are reacting in there. It grows because of the yeast and the baking powder. It pops, and then those bubbles set. This, on the other hand, is a different thing. The bubbles will be on the inside. Look at the way it's, look at the way this is puffing up now. See, inside it grows, and then as it fries, forms a skin. 
Excellent. He's a real chef, my friend. <laughs> After a few minutes, they need to be flipped. To be for sure it's ready. So I check it, all right? OK. It's ready. He's just being cocky now, isn't he? Even as a baker, it never fails to amaze me how many different breads can be created from just flour and water. All right, you put salt and pepper. Bit of seasoning. There's just one thing left to do. Get my Zalabia filled and get my laughing gear around it. The Zalabia, it's light and quite airy as well. But it's, it's like nothing I've ever had before. It's just... Wow. And it'd be rude not to try the Lahore while I'm here. It's quite open texture, and this is the much softer batter. Wow. It's so good. It's so fresh. And the falafel, crispy on the outside, beautiful and soft on the inside. I love this place. <laughs> I love it so much. My baking tour of Jerusalem is nearly at an end, but I've got one last stop to make. The foothills of the Judean mountains and the village of Ayan Karim. This particular area is fabled for being the birthplace of John the Baptist. And it's about 7K southwest of Jerusalem. The Yemeni flatbreads I've seen in the city have bowled me over. But there's another Yemeni bread that's usually home-baked for the Sabbath that I really want to try. Atalia, my guide in the old city, has recommended I visit her friend, Banaya, who bakes the best she knows. Hello. Paul. Nice to meet you. How are you? I'm fine. Lovely to meet you. Great place. I love this Welcome. setting. Welcome. Welcome. Um, the smell. Paul. The smell. Yes, this is the Kubana. Uh-huh. Our dish. Look at that. Ta-da. That looks amazing. It's like a giraffe, wow. but a dish. Kubana is usually made on Friday and left to bake on a very low heat overnight. It's eaten for Sabbath breakfast or brunch with boiled eggs, tomato salsa and sour cream. Wow. There is. <laughs> I've never seen a bread like this. And you haven't tasted it no, yet. No, I haven't. No. <laughs> yeah. So explain what this is. Um, this is a very simple yeast dough together with, with melted butter. And uh, I learned from my grandmother. And she used to work on this dough for hours, like, so much attention and so much love that everything she made was like just amazing. Did she write anything down, or no. is this just word of mouth? Mm -hmm. I used to call it the Yemenite croissant, but it's uh, real. You're right. It is. It's like having a croissant. It's like eating a croissant that you know when you get into the gooey bit of a croissant, you take away all the crispiness on the outside, and the bottom, and then you hit the middle bit and you just pull that little middle bit out. Mm -hmm. That's that. That's what it tastes like. You're right. <laughs> It, it makes me quite excited, actually. You have a heavy crisp on the top. You can hear that. And then inside, you have this very light dough. And at the bottom, now that's crispy, because the, the butter that's in there is soaked down, giving you a nutty caramel flavour. I've strewn bread all over the world, and this is up there. It's one of the best. It's a fantastic bread. I need to see how this is made. So this is your dough. It is. What's in this? Is flour, flour, salt, yeast, salt, sugar, yeah. and uh, yeast, yeast, of course, and this nigella seeds. So far, so normal. But where this bread differs from anything I've ever seen... So this is the butter. ..is how it's put together with the butter. And we're melting it at, until it will change the colour. Banaya heats the butter until it's a deep amber colour which gives it an intensely nutty flavour. She takes a pillowy ball of dough, dunks it into the butter, then smothers it in yet more butter, folds and places it in her baking tin. That's repeated until the tin is full. Oh. 
Thank you very much for today. God bless you, Paul. It's so good to have you here with us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. God bless you. Bye. Before I leave Jerusalem, I want to create something that will remind me of my time here. And Natalia has kindly offered to let me use her kitchen. Hello. Hello. How are you? How are you? Very well. Thank you. It's nice Very to well. see you again. And her beautiful roof terrace. And what I'm going to do is bake one of these. The beautiful pomegranate, date and almond cake. But first, I need to prepare the dates to make them nice and sticky. The dried dates might be a bit chewy in the cake, so I'm going to soften them in flavoured syrup on Italia's kitchen stove. Start with the zest of an orange, just straight into a pan, and the juice. Give the orange a good squeeze as well. And to get a real Israeli flavour, add some pomegranate juice and pomegranate molasses, which is condensed juice soft, light brown sugar, quite a lot, actually. Some butter, cinnamon, then cardamom and bicarb. Now, you think, why is he putting bicarb in it? It just helps break down the dates, basically. And if you get in there now, see what's happening. The acid, the bicarb together, see? It's fizzing away, That's what you look for. And the last thing to go in are the dates. Quite big pieces, throw them straight in. And the whole pan goes onto the stove. Let that bubble away for 10 minutes until the dates have softened. There you have it. So, I have my sticky dates. I'm going to prepare the dry ingredients now. Start with some almonds. I'm just going to chop them up quite roughly. Set some aside for later and pop the rest into a clean bowl. OK, now I'm going to add my plain flour and baking powder and some ground almonds. The addition of ground almonds to a cake is massive because what it does is it keeps the whole thing nice and moist, the cake. So if you keep it for a couple of days, even in a tin, if you don't eat it, it will hold a little bit of moisture in there. Now, they're the dry ingredients. They're good to go. Right, back to the cool date mix. To which you're going to add a couple of eggs. One, two. Give that a little mix together. Now we're going to incorporate this mixture in with the dry ingredients. It comes together beautifully and it tastes amazing. And for me, it's a real celebration of all the local ingredients that are around here. And there is the mixture. Quite soft. But that whole thing now goes into a tin. All I've done is line this with baking parchment. Look at the almonds in there. Some are chopped, some are whole. It'll give you a real texture when you bite into this cake. And top with the leftover chopped almonds. And this is ready to go in the oven. Baked at 180 for around 45 minutes to an hour. Smells amazing. To give it a beautiful glaze and added sweetness, I'm going to use more of the pomegranate molasses. Now, while the cake is warm, brush this onto the top. Don't be afraid to use it. The reason is it'll soak in, keep it nice and sweet, keep it fresher and softer on the top. But the main reason being, I've got some fresh pomegranates here. I'm just going to break some of these out of here and spread these across the top. These are going to be little jewels. There you have it. A beautiful date, almond and pomegranate cake. Not only have you got the pomegranates on the top, adds loads of texture to it and a little kick of flavour, but also you've got the molasses in there and you've got the pomegranate juice in there as well. This, for me, is a beautiful cake. It's fair to say I've been bowled over by Jerusalem even more than my first trip here with my nan some 24 years ago. 
It's one of my most favorite cities I think I've ever visited in my life. It is absolutely fascinating. And it doesn't really matter whether you're religious or not. It is worth coming. The food is, oh, so delicious. I've seen bakes that exist nowhere else on Earth, a direct result of a mix of cultures that make this city unique. It is truly incredible. 